go. Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Matt Miller. Matt Miller is the founder of School Spirit Vending. He started the company 10 and a half years ago out of a need to scratch his own entrepreneurial itch. He spent a lot of time in the United States Air Force and also in the medical devices industry as well as the advertising industry. But like many entrepreneurs, he had the itch that he didn't like taking orders from other people and he just wanted to chart his own path in life and create his own destiny. So he looked around and through a chance discussion with a friend, he got into the gumball vending space. And since then, he's taken off like a rocket. He's has um, vending operations all across the United States. He has over a hundred franchisees and thousands of vending machines in and around schools all over the United States. He also consults with people outside of the United States that are thinking of getting into the vending industry and help support them as they try to grow their business and scale up. So I'm pleased to have Matt on the show today to tell us a little bit about himself, his business, his experience, and of course, the industry vending, <laughs> the vending industry. So with that said, Matt, welcome to the program. Chi, thanks for having me on, man. It is so cool that we can be talking <laughs> you know, in, in two different countries and just here hanging out, man, as, yeah. as, we, as if we were sitting here having coffee, yeah. you know, in my office or in your living room. Which yeah. yeah, nice, nice. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get started in your entrepreneurial journey? Well, uh, I grew up in the Chicago area. I went to the Air Force Academy for college. That led me to being an Air Force pilot for nine years. Um, along the way, I realized that um, I was was not being satisfied creatively, and I also learned, like you mentioned, that I really didn't like being told what to do. So once my commitment was on was up, I was ready to move on to other things. I thought the corporate world would be the answer to that, and I ended up jumping into the corporate world back in 1998. Worked there for about 10 years, um, doing a variety of things. I worked in the medical industry for a while and then in the advertising industry where I spent almost a decade. Along the way, money got really, really tight because of some bad decisions we made, but more importantly, some decisions that were made by upper level management mm -hmm. that um, had a huge negative impact on me and my family. And with that, I realized that I needed to start doing some things on the side. And so initially we collected aluminum cans and sold them back. I sold Amazon books or books on Amazon and a number of different websites for several years before selling on Amazon was cool. Um, did whatever we had to do. The challenge was I had read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki along the way. Mm -hmm. And I bought into his whole idea of passive income and making money while you sleep. And I wasn't making money that way in any of the other stuff I was doing. And so my mind was ripe to hear my buddy that you mentioned when he talked about gumball machines. Mm. And so I gave that you know, took a look into vending, most specifically candy and gumballs to begin with, because I didn't have a whole lot of money that I could get started with. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I started. Fast forward a year and a half into learning the vending business, I had gotten into toys and temporary tattoos and stickers and that type of thing as well, and had about uh, 125 locations around the Houston area where we lived at the time. Mm -hmm. Then 07 and 08 hit, the market tanked, the economy collapsed, and lots of people were staying home instead of frequenting the businesses where I was doing business and where I had equipment. And so I was frustrated because revenues were down. That's when some young kids came knocking on my door, selling me stuff for the local school fundraiser. And I got this crazy idea of putting sticker machines in schools and doing custom stickers for them with their mascots and their colors and their logos, that type of thing, and turning it into a, a passive fundraiser for the school and into a passive income stream for initially just me and my family. Mm -hmm. And so had this crazy idea, a good buddy of mine who was an elementary PE teacher in uh, the southwest part of Houston. Uh, got me in his school 10 and a half years ago as a test 
and things have taken off since then. Like you said, we've got over 100 franchisees in the U.S. Um, we've vended over 40 million stickers in the last 10 and a half years. And not only are we continuing to grow like a weed here stateside, but we're also uh, starting to work with folks in other countries uh, as a consultant and, and to potentially provide desire to do what we do in their country. Mm. Man, I love your story because it shows that, you know, contrary to what people say in the media that, oh, you know, you become an overnight success, you know, you start a company and just boom, you're making money hand over fist. You actually went through some very difficult times. I know uh, having heard your story, you, at one point you, when you started this business, you were also delivering pizza. Is that correct? Yeah, money was so tight, she and I needed seed capital so bad because our credit rating was terrible. Mm. So I couldn't um, borrow any money. So the only other option I had at the time was bringing in more. Mm. And the job that I had, even though it didn't provide the money that we needed, it was very flexible. I was able to work out of home. And in the process, it gave me some freedom to do what I needed to do as long as I continued to give 100% to my work. Yeah. And so I wasn't willing to walk away from that to make some extra money somewhere else because the goal was to get free and to do my own thing full time, not to work for somebody else. Yeah. So I stayed there and then I started delivering pizzas for pizza hut. I did that for 18 months on top of, my traditional vending business and those 125 locations on top of starting SSV mm -hmm. on top of being a father of three and a husband and active in my church. Uh, life was really, really, really busy there for a while. Mm. Um, one summer the air conditioning went out in my van and we didn't have the money to afford to get it fixed. So I did all of that in Houston, 100 degree plus temperatures with 100 percent humidity yeah um we just kind of had to do whatever we had to do man yeah. and uh, didn't make any excuses for it just figured out a way to make it happen yeah because um I, what i want people to take away from your story is basically that you know what when you have a dream and a goal you just have to go at it and go get it you know there's there shouldn't be anything stopping like matt had three jobs a full family you know, commitments at church and other social commitments too. And yet he still kept his eyes on the ball, did what he had to do. I even remember one of the things you said in one of your other interviews that you got turned down for a payday loan. And a payday loan, you don't even need credit. You just need to show your bank statement and and you they'll give you money at exorbitant interest rate, but they even turned you down. So that was like the lowest of low point, you know, when you couldn't even get a payday loan. So in addition to you hustling and doing what it takes. Well, I know it must have like hurt you like psychologically in terms of like, you know, being able to provide for yourself and your family. So what were you doing to improve your mindset during that difficult time so that you didn't take all those um, negative things in and keep you depressed and keep you down? Man, that's a great question. She, thanks for asking that. Number one, <clears throat> I learned early on in my life, not to really care about what other people think. Um, I, in high school, I, I played football and I ran track and I was, I sang in the choir and I was in 12 different musicals and plays. So I had all my buddies that were on the football team that always gave me a hard time about, uh, about being in the choir. And mm -hmm. then I had all my buddies in, in, in theater and in the choir, giving me a hard time about football. And I, I, there was a bunch of bullying that went on in, especially in junior high where I, there was a group of guys that would follow me home off the bus and mm -hmm. I, I was getting beat up right regularly, et cetera. I, I just learned how to shut that out, developed a thick skin. And so a lot of that, where is it? I was aware, I just realized not, not to let it get me down. Mm. Mindset is everything. 
And so the most important investment any of us can make in ourselves is in our mindset. It's not in the stock market. It's, it's no, in our mindset. Because where your mind is, is where everything around you goes. Hmm. So I read all the time. I got myself around whatever successful person that I could uh, to learn from them. I listened to audiobooks and CDs and cassette tapes before that as I was driving down the road because I could associate with those people mentally mm -hmm. in dead time in my car. Mm -hmm. So I did all of those things knowing that at this, the brain was the most important thing. And in the process, that helped us work through all those things. I also knew that, you know what, I, I had done some pretty incredible things. You know, I had been in the top 10% of my high school class. I had, I had graduated from the Air Force Academy. There were 60,000 people that applied for school there the year that I got accepted. And there was mm -hmm. only 12 or 1300 of us that got accepted. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was an Air Force pilot. So in my early 20s, I was responsible for multi-million dollar airplanes and, and training students how to fly. Mm -hmm. So I remembered those success stories from my past. Mm. And I ut utilized that to where to constantly remind myself that, listen, Matt, it might really suck right now but you're better than this. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a situation that you're in. It's not you. Yeah. And once I realized that I was able to steadily and in a disciplined fashion each and every day, take another step further, another step forward, another step forward. And over time we worked ourselves out of all that. I got to be honest with you, the most humbling experience I have ever had in my life was asking for that job at Pizza Hut. Hmm. The second most humbling experience was me running around at night with my uniform delivering pizzas mm -hmm. and going by people's homes that I knew from church, them knowing my background and seeing me as a delivery driver. Hmm. But once again, those people weren't gonna take care of my family. True. And quite honestly, it didn't matter what they think because they aren't living their life for me. I'm living my life for me. I, I give people this example. In fact, I just did a podcast episode in one of the shows that I do. It's called the Sowing Seed Podcast, where I talk about stop worrying what other people think. And I, I, I bring up the example of my mom and dad. Both my parents, I'm blessed, they're still living. Uh, they live in, the, in Wisconsin, and I live down here in Texas. Well, my mom and dad, aside from my wife and three kids, are the most important people in the world to me. They're my biggest fans, aside from my, you know, my, my family here. Mm -hmm. But the reality is they live in Wisconsin. I live in Texas. We're, we're all living life. I probably think of them realistically maybe 30 minutes a month. Well, if I'm spending only that much time thinking about the people who brought me into this world, how much is Bob down at the office thinking or talking about you mm. yet you're giving Bob complete and total power over you mm. because you're letting what you think he's thinking dictate you and your life and what you need to do. Mm. Forget about Bob. He's not thinking about you. And even if he is, he's not going to pay the bills if something happens to you and your family, True. he's not going to step in the gap. So because of that, his opinion means nothing. Oh, man, so powerful. So powerful. I love that. So you did all that hustle, you know, things started to take off, you know, your friend got you into the first school. How did you start getting other schools to let you come in? Or is there a step I'm missing? You know, Chi, it's funny you ask that because I had gone door to door with the traditional vending. So I'd go into restaurants and businesses and get my gumball machines or whatever place there. So what do you think I naturally started out doing? Doing the exact same thing in schools. Mm. And what I found out is I talked to a lot of really neat administrators and principals 
but none of them were what I would call an early adopter. None okay. of them were forward thinkers. None of them were leaders by their actions. And so they thought it was a great idea, but none of them were willing to step out and try the new. And so I was frustrated, man, because I had this idea. We had been testing in this school for months at that point in time, and the numbers were off the charts. And I'm like, okay, I, I got to figure out a way to get the word out. And right around then, I was doing some surfing online, and, and I came across um, a, a volunteer organization here in the States uh, conference for school volunteers. Mm. And it just happened to be 30 minutes from my home outside of Houston. So I reached out to my buddy, Jeremy, who got me in his first school, in that first school. I reached out to another buddy, Shane, that I had taught vending to previously. And I said, guys, you've heard me talking about this. What do you guys think about us splitting a table and just seeing what happens? And so we all split the cost of that table. I got a, a, a logo put together in a matter of a week or so. I bought some cheesy black and white t-shirts from somewhere online that could turn them around in a couple of days. And we showed up at this event having no idea what we were doing, just had a crazy idea yeah. in one school yeah. that was working. <clears throat> well, we got 10 schools out of that event. Mm. It got excited about what we were doing. And that was the foundation for everything. From there, we had other friends who heard about what we were doing, who liked the idea of working in and out of schools and supporting them in their fundraising efforts and making money in a more passive fashion. And they joined the, or the team. Uh, I realized that I needed to set up a, a distributor model at the time where it was a state, they essentially paid a licensing or royalty um, to have access to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then three years ago, we finally became a, a franchise here in the U S but, mm. um, yeah, I mean, it was one step at a time, 13 years to overnight success, man. Yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, you have so many lessons here because first of all, you went where the audience is, where your market is, you know, schools at a school conference, perfect place to, leverage the opportunity so that way everybody's there and they get to see you and you get to talk with them one-on-one -on -one. and at least you know the scale of being at one point where everybody can see you means that you know what in as much as somebody else might not be ready because they see other people getting excited about the idea and taking you up on the offer to try it out they to become convinced and say hey let me let me get on that and see if it'll actually work too. so so i love that and i want people to think about if you're starting a business, whether it's vending, whether it's whatever, you, you need to think about where your ideal market is and go stay right where they are until you convince somebody to, to take you up on your offer. And then you went from that to you know, working with friends and then eventually franchising. So my question is, when you started thinking about franchising, did you understand? Because I know franchising is a very intricate and legal area of business. So did you understand what it meant to be a franchise uh, model? Because I know it will mean people having to follow kind of strict rules and regulations that you have set out. Did you think that people would want to do that? Or was there anything you did differently to make the franchising model work for you as opposed to how it works for other companies? Gee, I, it wasn't even on my radar to be a franchise three and a half years ago, but I had hired a business coach, a guy by the name of Aaron Walker, and Aaron has spent 36, 37 years in business, uh -huh. millionaire, bought and sold eight or nine businesses at the time. And he started, he and I started meeting every week on the phone and he started making me think and look at the world from a completely different vantage. Uh -huh. point that I had. And he said, you know what? I'll never forget. He called me one Monday for our normally scheduled time. And he said, you know what, Matt, I've been looking at the data. Do you have any idea how many schools there are in the United States that you're mm. not in yet? He, he said, you've done a great job in the first, you know, seven years or so. But there is so much opportunity out there that and the only thing keeping you from it is those schools don't know who you are. He said, if I was you, I would put 100% focus on figuring out how to grow and get the word out. 
Well, I started doing some research on marketing and ways to do this and that. And <clears throat> um, that led to uh, me reaching out to my attorney who had established the distributorship uh, program for us early on. He g went and checked with some other attorneys at his firm and he said, he came back, he said, Matt, you really need to be a franchise. He said, if you wanna grow in the Midwest, out in California, in New York and in the Northeast, a lot of those states have a lot more strict mm -hmm. uh, requirements for businesses like yours. And the only way that you're gonna be able to do it successfully is as a franchise. Mm. So I was like, holy smokes, how am I gonna do this? I don't have any money put away, but we figured it out. I was mm. able to borrow some money to get all the legal and everything done. I, I found several books by franchises out there and kind of learn the basics. Um, and then I, I hired the expertise in the form of a franchise attorney to help me take what I had been doing and, and marry it with all the legal and all the government requirements and all that type of thing. The one thing that I did early on, Chi, that I did not realize at the time was because I was a pilot for nine years, we live by checklists. Mm -hmm. And so every step of a flight, there's a checklist that you follow because airplanes are very, very complex and it's real easy to miss a step and that could kill people. Yeah. So when I started SSV, I kind of put systems in place in a way that it was comfortable for me because I knew if I was going to continue to add more and more people, I needed to have, be able to do so and not completely lose every, every bit of my life mm -hmm. in support of those folks. So thankfully, I was already doing a lot of that stuff already. And all I needed was the legal folks uh, to do what they needed to do. And so it took us a couple of months to work through the legal. There was a 20-page questionnaire that I had to fill out, which mm. was very, very detailed. So the attorneys could do the work they needed to do to create our franchise disclosure document or FDD for short, which every franchise in the U S has to have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I guess the beginning of July, uh, 2015. So almost three years ago was when we sold our very first franchise. And since then we've added 76 franchises, wow. I believe. Wow. And uh, I, I've had thousands of people reach out about what we're doing and, and have interest in it. So it's, it's, it's been a wild ride. Yeah. Um, but it was one of those situations where I hired experts. experts because I have no desire to be an expert in franchise law. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I desire to be a, an expert in, uh, in accounting or in tax law. So that's why I have an accountant and a bookkeeper and then, of course, uh, a couple of attorneys that I work with, depending on what needs to be done. Awesome, 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 awesome. So you do that, and this thing is growing. So your franchisees are, like you said, spread across the U.S., over 100 right now. Um, my question is, have you, are you guys solely focused on schools alone or did you start branching out again into other areas? Like I remember when I used to work in corporate, we have like um, vending machines in the break rooms. And I think they were stuck by Pepsi and all those guys. I, I forget their names, but have you guys thought of going into offices or like, like you said, churches or even sporting events? I know they'd have, they'd have um, vending machines right now, but um, given that you are doing something that also brings in income for the organization as well as yourself. Are there other avenues where you see your business growing into? Uh, you know what? There are still so many schools, Chi, mm. in the U.S. that, to be honest, uh, we don't really need to go there. Okay. Um, there's a real benefit of being very niche in what we do. We sell okay. stickers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we direct the printing and design of those stickers, uh, we, you know, we're part of the entire process and, and um, not to say that we couldn't do other things, but, but we still have 20 years worth of opportunity okay. in 
just wow. in the U.S. Wow. In, in what we're doing, let alone, uh, you know, working in any other niche or in. Okay. And has there been any difficult or challenging things that have um, made it a bit of a nightmare? So what I'm saying is give us a scenario where you had a real difficult time getting this business off the ground, whether it's getting into a school or working with a franchise partner that kind of did things that were wrong and you had to terminate the relationship. Was there a very challenging moment in the course of running this business in your experience? You know, I, I would say the, the most challenging moment we've had is just in the fact, and thankfully technology has, has run faster than we have grown. Mm. But uh, the most challenging thing is heading up a decentralized team all over the country. Okay. You know, with 110 different families in 42 or 43 states, um, how do you communicate? How do you disseminate information? How do you receive feedback? Uh, how do you teach? How do you motivate? How do you train? All those things are real world challenges that make what we do pretty complex. Cause it's not like a corporation where you've got an office building downtown in whatever mm -hmm. city you're in and every last employee is there. And if you need to, you all meet in the conference room and you know, you cover what you need to cover. Thankfully today there are tools like podcasts, like uh, there are tools like zoom. There are tools like these types of things that um, are available that allow us to do what we do. I, as an example, I became a podcaster three years ago initially for the express purpose of providing a podcast for our franchise team. Mm. So talk about niche. Yeah. I, I do two shows a week for, for 110 people. Wow. But, but those shows have developed community and camaraderie and help me teach and train in the most efficient way for them to learn, which is listening while they're in the middle of driving down the road or working out, or mowing the lawn, or whatever. So um, it's worth it. It provides mm. continuity, et cetera, in, in everything that we do. Mm. Um, we also do uh, monthly mastermind calls by region. We've got five regions around the country. Mm -hmm. And so each region has an hour with me on Zoom once a month, same time, same a uh, day every single month so it's predictable so so we can do some teaching but so that they can have face-to-face -face time with me mm -hmm. they can get questions answered from the source uh, they can have their peers sharing best practices and if somebody has a question or concern it's not just me answering it's it's a it's a collective of, of people that are answering mm -hmm. we also do monthly webinars on topics that are open to the entire team so thankfully, technology has gotten us to the point where we can step up and do some of these things. Um, and here I am in central Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, I call it E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we, you know, we do most of what we need to do from right here um, in support of the team day to day. Man, that is, that is just awesome. The power of technology to make things scale that from no matter where you're from or where you're living, you can still affect people thousands of miles around you. And one thing you said here that just gave me chills was that you're using podcasting to grow your niche business. Now, I'm working on a book for um, small business owners to leverage the power of podcasting to grow their business. And I think I'm going to include you in that. So we'll talk after the show. But what I wanted to find out from you was, as you created the podcast to service your franchisees and people that are interested in, in this industry, what were the benefits you saw directly from starting your niche podcast and how has it helped people that are in your, your world? Well, what I found was that I was, we had a blog and, and we were doing most of our announcements on a WordPress site that is a private 
login site for the mm -hmm. franchise team. And I started realizing that we'd put out something really, really, really important in the blog. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have conversations over the next couple of weeks with folks in our, in my day to day. And even though it was on the website, even though they, everybody gets an email of each blog post as they come out, even though we even have a weekly wrap up with all the blog posts and all the podcasts that are released each week, mm -hmm. it comes in, in a newsletter kind of format. There were a number of people that had no clue what I was talking about. And mm -hmm. I was like, wait a second. If these guys who should be 100% invested in this are not getting the information, then society has moved on. Mm. And, and that's what's happened. What do yeah. we do? We're all headline readers now. We're all social media, you know, quick snippets here and there, not a half a page or a page long reading anything. Mm. And so I realized in order for me to better, more effectively communicate, I needed to change with the times. The other thing that the podcast allowed me to do was share success stories. Um, I had a young guy down in Miami, Florida, uh, recently graduated from high school. He, he got married to his high school sweetheart. And he called me up one day all excited because he had this success story where he had won school talk to seven others while he was sitting in the principal's office and six of those other schools like got started in our program within the next week. Hmm. And I was like, how can I share the lessons from that? How can I share what he did? And then the light bulb came on. I was like, well, I just hmm. need to do a podcast interview with him. Let him talk. Let me shine the light on him because it was him that did it. Mm -hmm. I just need to be the vessel to help him do that. Mm -hmm. and, and that can become a very effective teaching tool for our entire team. Mm -hmm. And so I took Cliff Ravenscraft. I don't know if you're familiar with Cliff. Yes, yeah, podcast answer, man. I, I took his uh, course May uh, three years ago, podcasting A to Z. Mm -hmm. Within 30 days, I had... A podcast up and running um, and I did did the two for internally for our team but then I also did one where I interview school fundraising companies all across the US as well mm -hmm. um, that is a public podcast for schools out there as a resource and I just got started and and here we are we have literally released two episodes every week for going on the last three years we have over 250 episodes that I've done just for our franchise team. But here's what's so awesome as well, Chi. I just had a brand new franchisee get started yesterday. Mm -hmm. He has access to all of that archive and every last bit of it is just as valid and important to him learning and getting started today as it was when I published it. So now on his own time, he can absorb himself in our world using those podcasts as one of the tools that he can learn from. I don't have to go back and recreate those episodes. Yeah. I don't have to go back and teach those lessons myself. The audio is there for him and his wife and anybody else that comes along to access whenever they want. Love that. Love that. So let's transition over into the international consulting. And you told me earlier that you have people reach out to you from overseas, which is doubling. So tell us a little bit more about your international consulting and then the opportunities for people outside of the U S to get into the vending industry. So I've had consistently probably 10 to 15% of the people that have reached out over the last three years have been people international. And we've done some testing in Canada. We thought about potentially franchising up there, but what I've learned along the way is, well, first off, I'm, I'm, I, I'll be 51 in two weeks. Mm. I'm, I'm one year away from being an empty nest with all my kids being out of the house and in school or, or, or off on their own. And I'm just at a stage in my life where I have no desire to keep track of what's going on in the U S plus mm -hmm. countries all over the world. Cause franchise law is different in every country. 
and it, you've got to have a different documentation and huge investment involved and all that. Well, I finally had a couple reach out to me here about a month and a half ago from Ireland. And we did a Zoom call and we talked and just a really, really sharp couple, a couple of realtors, and they really had interest in, in doing what we do in Ireland. And I, I just finally said, you know what, guys, I'll tell you what. I, I, don't, I don't have any desire to franchise in Ireland. I, I don't. But here's what I will do. If you guys want to pay me as a consultant, I will fly to Ireland and I'll help you do an assessment over several days of your area in relation to vending, what's being done there now, price points and all that. And then we'll go spend a couple of days talking to schools and educators and administrators in the schools and get a feel for what their thoughts are about our program, uh, about what they do for fundraising and the need and all of that. Then after I give you my assessment, if that makes sense and you want to move forward, then you can fly here to Texas for a long weekend and of course, this is paid for training, just like the consultant, but we'll train you, we'll teach you everything we know, and then I will be a coach for you for a six month period of time as you're getting things up and running. But you guys take it and run with it and do whatever you want in your country. I have no ties to it whatsoever after the training and consulting is done, but take what I've learned and make make a ton of money where you are. Mm. And so that's what we're doing moving forward because there has been such a demand overseas, but I, I'm just not at a place in my life where where I want I, I want to expand that would, you know, that being a franchise would require. Yeah. So it's gonna allow us to to duplicate what we do in countries potentially all over the world. And I can still be the teacher and the trainer and the educator and utilize my knowledge to make sure that they're starting something that has a pretty high probability of success in their yeah. area instead of them having to go out and figure it all out all on their own like I had to for the last yeah. 11 years. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's so awesome because you, I think it's, you're coming from a space of abundance and openness where you know there's opportunity there, but life circumstances, you don't want to stress yourself. You know, you have things you're already doing. You're happy with the way life is going for you, but you're willing to share and invest in others, like sowing the seed into their lives so that they too can germinate and sprout and grow into a big tree. And then, of course, they're going to replicate the same thing because I'm sure once they're successful in Ireland, in wherever they are, in Dublin or wherever, they could say, hey, you know, we we'll train other people in other parts of Ireland or in the UK or France or whatever, and it will just keep going from there. So one thing I I like about you and what you're doing is that the generosity of heart in being able to open yourself up to say, hey, guys, you know what, you can take what I've done, make yourselves wealthy, make a ton of money, change, you know, achieve your own dreams, and then, of course, give back to society because this is not just a profit only venture it's also something that the schools can use to generate revenue because all over the world schools are underfunded whether it's the u.s or in ireland or france everywhere you go schools are always underfunded and this is another revenue stream where they can bring in money bring to bring programs to life to change the lives of students that need them yeah i i mean i it's funny you and i think i maybe mentioned it early on in the in the interview but you know, I launched a podcast here back in October called the Sewing Seed Podcast, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and my entire life philosophy is my job and you, and our job as humans on this earth is to sow good seed and then let God grow it. Yeah. So, so the show is Sowing Seed: Faith, Family, Farming, and Financial Freedom. The four things that are that are kind of what I stand for. And um, yeah, this is just another way for me to sow a lot of good seed out there that, that others can benefit from if they choose to do so. Um, and of course, my family can benefit from it too. Yeah. And, and all the work that we've put in to, to capitalize on and to figure this whole thing out yeah. so that others don't have to spend that time to do it. Yeah, great. So as we start to wind out the show, um, Matt, tell us, 
looking back on your journey thus far, do you think there's anything you could have done differently to help you um, achieve your success faster? You know, the biggest thing is she is set bigger goals. Oh. Um, my goal for so long was to walk away from the corporate world and be my own boss. And that was it. So seven and a half years ago, I accomplished that. And I got bored mm. really quick. I was taking naps half the day. I, you know, we had moved out into the country and we had started doing some farming and raising some animals. And I love gardening. So I've got a huge vegetable garden every year, et cetera. But I was really bored. Mm. And it wasn't until I hired Aaron Walker as my coach and I got around the group of men through his mastermind group that I'm a part of today called um, Iron Sharpens Iron, the company he runs is called View from the Top, mm -hmm. that, uh, that I realized that I didn't have a goal. I had gotten there. I did it, Yeah, you know, uh, by 43 and a half, I guess. And all of a sudden, I'm wallowing without really any purpose in my life because I did it. Yeah. So to have him speak into my life and to say, come on, dude, you got a lot more to do. You got a lot more to accomplish. Do you have any idea what you got your hands on here? Go for it. And then for him to encourage and to provide accountability, it's mm. et cetera. And his insights in business during that period of time was huge. Um, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I, I had nobody in my life who was a business owner growing up. So all of this stuff, quite honestly, I kind of just figured out on my own and we did all right, but nowhere near where we are today. And on the trajectory we're heading now, because I, you know, you are the sum of uh, the five people that you hang out with and the books that you read. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't have those five people for a long time in my life. I've got more than five today with the group of guys that I run with and that I'm around and it has completely changed everything. Um, but at the time I was bored out of my mind and just yeah. not really knowing what to do next. Mm. That's, that's, that's so powerful. And with that said, my friend, we've reached the um, end of the podcast. It's, it's been an amazing time getting to learn more about you, your story, and your business. But before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about where people can find you, get to know about you, of course, get to contact you, and find out more about um, what you're doing in the vending industry. So, uh, she, they can go to, uh, well, I wrote a short ebook called Live Your Dreams, The Top 10 Reasons Why You Need to Own a Vending Business. Okay. And they can go to ssvbusiness.com slash bulletproof and they can download that ebook for free. It'll give them some insights into uh, my 13 years experience in the industry, some things they probably have never even thought of in relation to vending. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if they want to begin a dialogue, if they're in the U.S. and, and have an interest in looking into the franchise, we can definitely begin a dialogue there or if they're overseas and potentially interested in, in having an assessment done in their area and, and the consulting that I do, uh, we can chat as well. Um, other than that, like I mentioned, the Sowing Seed podcast is uh, on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, you name it. It's also an Amazon Alexa brief for those that have an Amazon Echo. And, uh, so anyway, I think I provide a lot of value, a lot of insights about life and 30 years with a very diverse background in the military, in the corporate world, and as an entrepreneur that a lot of people don't have. And, uh, you know, hopefully the show will be a blessing to them, if nothing else. Yeah, great. And I'll put all the links in the show notes um, once this podcast goes live. So thanks for coming to share your story and your words of wisdom, Matt. I really appreciate the hour you've spent and, of course, the, the knowledge and the wisdom you've shared from the heart. Thank you, Chi. God bless you, man. God yeah. bless you. Yeah, we're done. 
Hey, Chi, I've got to tell you something. Yeah. Um, I've done about 350 of these in the last three years. Um, you are the best listener and have asked the most insightful questions wow. uh, of anybody I've been interviewed by. Wow. Um, the, the little nuances and the little things that, that you clued in on and we talked about and all that, most people are so surface. Um, so I was able to cover some stuff with you that I've never had a chance to cover before Wow! just because of the line of questioning. So um, I, I appreciate that. You, you, you need to keep doing what you're doing well, because th thanks um, man. Because you're really, really good at it. I, pre I, pre I appreciate that. I've been struggling with whether I should continue or I should stop, but I really appreciate you, you sharing that with me. It's really, really a pat on the back and it's an inspiration to keep um, going on. So thank you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, what, it, what is it about it that, that you're, you've been questioning? No, because the, the thing I've been questioning was um, specifically, A, do I invest more time doing this? Where, like I said, I just moved here from Nigeria. So I need to either start a business or get a job and get money coming in. But at the same time, I love getting these words of wisdom from people. So I don't, I don't want to spend so much time interviewing and not, you know, taking care of um, what I need to take out, like myself and my family. So I'm wondering, do I reduce the interviews? Do I stop for a time and um, focus on getting some income coming in and then, you know, continuing again? Things like, things like that were on my mind. Let, let me give you a couple insights that sure. might help you. Sure. Um, number one, batch your content. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, meaning, uh, are you familiar with Entrepreneur on Fire and John Lee Dumas? Yes, yes. Okay. He does seven shows a week, right? Mm -hmm. He's been doing that for four or five years. He does eight interviews every Monday and he does nothing else the rest of the week. Mm. So even though he's got one, one, one of these shows out there that takes the most time to put together, to edit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what it takes to put an episode together. Yeah. yeah. He does it all in a day. So the other six, six days of the week, he does whatever the heck he wants to do, whether mm. it be build other businesses, support his listeners in other ways, travel, do whatever. Okay. Um, so batch, that would be the first thing I would tell you, mm -hmm. um, get to where you're just taking a small, a certain window of time every week to knock yeah. out what you need to, um, that's the first thing. The second thing is if you believe that you've got a lot of insights that have value to the world, then I would encourage you to maybe mix it up a little bit and okay. maybe, maybe you do some solo episodes. Okay and do interview episodes solo episodes are a game changer and here's why i have my sowing seed is a three day a week show mm -hmm. it's the simplest thing that i do here's why mm. because it's only me i'm not having to schedule anybody into my schedule i'm not having to do research on anybody else mm. i'm not having to do any of that it's just as topics come to mind along the lines of faith, family, farming, or financial freedom, I talk about them. I oftentimes will sit down about every two weeks on a Saturday morning for mm -hmm. three or four hours and I'll batch record eight, 10, 12 episodes okay. all at once. And then I don't have to think about it for another several weeks yeah. or, or a month or more because I'm doing it all at one time. I, I don't know about you. I'm busy. I, I'm running yeah. a franchise. Yeah. I've got a family. I've got five podcasts that I actually do every week. Mm -hmm. So I am crazy busy. Yeah. And, and for me to jump from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, I, I, I can't do it. Mentally, I cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So I find the times of the week where I am in the mood, where I feel like I'm thinking the best and I have the most insights to provide and give. And then I just sit down at the mic because it's sitting right here in my office and record. Okay. Um, 
game changer. Now, another thing that'll be a, a game changer for you, especially if you take that route, how are you doing editing and all that stuff right now? Um, I do it on, um, what's it called? ScreenFlow. So I just edit, I turn it okay. into a file for ScreenFlow, edit it, and then uh, convert and then you, it to MP3 you, okay. in uh, GarageBand. Yeah. Once, if you decide to do some solo stuff, get the app called Boss Jock. B-O-S-S-J-O-C-K. What it will allow you to do is take intros and outros and your, you know, your music and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Put those files on it. And so like last night, I, I recorded four episodes. Okay. I've got Boss Jock on an iPad hooked up to my mixing board here um, and my computer. And so when I'm ready to go, I press a little button on Boss Jock and it plays my intro. Mm. And then I start talking. Okay. And when I'm getting ready to get done, I press another button and it presses my outro. I am recording and mixing all at one time. Mm. So there's no editing that I have to do at the end. Okay. Does that's, that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of sense. And it's super efficient. Now you got to get to the point where you're comfortable pressing a few buttons and talking and all that yeah. at the same time. It might take a few times to work through that. Mm -hmm. But once again, it's, it's a simple little thing that you can change up, especially with your solo episodes, though you could do it with interviews too, if you wanted to, Yeah. Um, to where literally your production time after the interview is very limited. Mm -hmm. Most of your time is spent, talking and doing what you do best yeah does that make sense yeah that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense yeah so um that's the, man that wow that is so powerful thanks a lot man i appreciate that so i like i said during the interview also i kind of got the inspiration to write a book on podcasting for small businesses because like i said i just moved here to toronto and not a whole lot of companies are doing podcasting like they are in the u.s and i know how beneficial and how powerful it could be to start one especially if you have things like you know franchisees listening or even like the one i saw that was a big need was for freight companies who had like thousands of drivers driving across canada but yet a lot of them always complain that you know it's a boring ride they either listen to music or they don't have time to educate their driver so i was thinking if if a freight company starts a freighting podcast for example talking about drivers needs or how to improve their business that will help everybody in the industry so dude, i said that, dude that would be huge yeah i i you're on to something there i'm okay. actually thinking about uh this year starting to do some consulting for companies in a similar way, but, mm. but primarily in the franchise industry here yeah. in the U S because nobody else is doing what I'm doing Yeah, and they need to be, um, but they wouldn't even know where to start. So I could step in and help them. And even if I needed to do the interviews for a while until they got their legs under them. Um, so yet yeah, I, I think, I think that would be huge. It might, mm. might take a little bit of time to get a company or two yes. you know, to be willing to embrace it. But dude, once you do that, uh, cheat up. No, you, you and I are tracking, dude. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Be because I thought about it and I said, okay, if I'm to do this, let me research how many companies that there are in this area, their industries, and also how many people I think I can meet. And I did it's, it's taken over 90 days, but I've gotten like 20,000 companies that I could potentially talk to. So now I have to narrow it down to the first 10 or 100 and then start pitching them and seeing how it's going to go. So I was saying, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need to at least go with something, which is a book. So I'm going, I want to write a book maybe in the next 30 days, just something quick, podcasting for small businesses, how it's going to help your business improve, help uh, lead generation and all that. And when you were talking, I was like, man, that... That should be like my chapter one or something, you know, how, <laughs> how, how Matt used podcasting to grow his franchising business and how it's become a perpetual trainer for people that will come into his funnel because once they listen and go through it, they're like, okay, now they are like softened up and ready to go. And then they can call him and make the, um, the conversation of either hiring him 
as a consultant or buying into the franchise. So I said, yeah, that I'm going to definitely, I'll, I'll shoot you an email maybe by tomorrow. I just need to sketch it out. But then I want you to just write four pages or five pages, whatever you, even if it's an audio file, record and send to me like the benefits of podcasting in your business. I already have it here, but if you think of anything else and then we'll put it together, I'll talk to a bunch of other people that I've interviewed and are doing podcast interviews or doing podcasts for their own businesses and then compile all that and then start going out with that. Cause I think once you have a book, like your ebook or something, at least it starts a conversation to get you yeah. in the door and then from there you can go forward with that. So yeah. that, that's where I was thinking. And when you mentioned it, I was just like, man, it's like God is just sending, uh, <laughs> sending this guy down here to tell me that, okay, yeah, this thing is actually making sense. Yeah, she, no doubt about it, man. No doubt. Um, yeah, anything I can do to help there, I'd love to do it. Okay. Um, are you familiar with a guy by the name of Scott Beebe? No. Okay, you need to meet Scott Beebe. Okay. Um, he has a podcast called the business on purpose podcast, the business on purpose. He was part of a nonprofit for years down, uh, and worked in and out of Nigeria. Okay. Um, he now goes down and does, uh, free, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, he, he basically goes down to Nigeria a couple times a year for several weeks and okay. he, he does free consulting for businesses down there. Okay. Uh, helping teach them on sy systems and processes and all that. Okay. But anyway, amazing guy. One of my best friends. Um, I, I think you guys would have a lot in common. And mm -hmm. once again, he, he's a podcaster and is kind of in this world. Yeah. And um, I, I think it would be beneficial for the two of you guys to meet. Okay. Um, I will reach out to him. What's his last name? Scott B. How do you spell it? B E E B E. Okay. First okay. name Scott. Yes. And it's uh, called the Business on Purpose podcast. Mm -hmm. And then the only other thing I'd say is, um, are you familiar with the conference podcast movement? Yes, by um, Jared Easley. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's going to be in Philadelphia, which is a lot closer to you uh, than what it's been in, in years past. Mm. I, I don't know what your capability is or whatever, but um, man, if you can make it at the end of July, okay. I think that would be a game changer for you also. Jared is the real deal. This will be my fourth year in a row going to that event. Okay. And you know, there's going to be a couple thousand podcasters there. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I spoke with because um, I'm in the, the ability um, to rub shoulders and and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm in the podcast movement group. So last okay. year, I think I communicated with him because I was in Nigeria. I said like, no way I can make it. He was like, oh, that. Whenever I'm closer and I want to make it, I should call call him or email him and let him know. But now that I'm here, I think definitely I'm going to make make that move because it was a very generous offer of him to invite me, and I was like. I'm in Nigeria. Nothing I could do. <laughs> yeah. The only other thing I would tell you, Chi, is probably in the short. This is this is just from my decades of being around entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I would. I you probably want to find something to do to have some money coming in immediately. Yeah. Even if it's just something part time. I mean, you, you'll you've got to assess what your needs are, what your yeah. expenses are, whatever. But the last thing I want to have happen for you is that you feel so under pressure financially that it puts undue pressure on your business to where to prospective clients can, can feel that. Mm. And there's a big difference in somebody who's desperate to get business and somebody who isn't. Mm. And so by keeping your financial foundation strong as you're putting this thing together in this new place, mm -hmm. um, that allows you to do this right Yeah. instead of making decisions that might not be the best long-term just mm -hmm. because you got to have some money coming in. This coming week. in, yeah. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, so um, I I'm actually going to work on that because – as I was listening to your story, I was like, you know what? A lot of these things are gelling with what I'm thinking because I'm like, yes, I need to pay bills. So, you know what? I want to build this business. I can build this business, but I need to have 
flexibility. So even if it means taking a part-time job. And as you were just talking about, you know, reflecting on your past successes and all that stuff, I'm like, yes, I, I have past successes too. You know, it might be a temporary situation, but that temporary situation is not going to last forever as long as right. I do do what I need to do to, to get through this period and then to keep moving forward. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think... In as much as people got a lot out of this interview with you, I think I got the most just because you were speaking directly to where I am right now. So, I mean, you've really been a blessing to me, man. I, I just want to really thank you so much because uh, I, I, well, ex- you, I wasn't expecting this <laughs> this morning. <laughs> and here's the thing, Chi. If I could do anything to help, please let me know. Definitely. Um, I, it, it's It's been a real honor, and I wasn't blowing smoke about um, – you as an interviewer and all of that. I, like I said, I've done 350 of these in the last three years. And um, so thank you for taking the time. Yeah. Um, and, but also for being, for truly listening because um, that I think is a, is a characteristic that most people don't have mm. in interviewing and it's obvious that you do. So anyway, Appreciate it, man. It's been awesome. My pleasure. It's been awesome. And I'll definitely keep in touch, Matt. I will. Awesome. And we'll we'll, uh, maybe see you in Philly here in a couple of months. Yeah, I'll put it on my radar. Awesome. God bless you, man. God bless you, man. Take care. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.